Welcome to the Survival Prepper Show, where being labeled a crazy prepper is a badge of honor. Learn about disaster preparedness, survival, and get ready for whatever challenges might come your way. This is not your typical prepping podcast, and they won't be silenced by the censors. Here are your hosts, Duff and Dale. Everyone, welcome to the show. Uh, tonight we've got a good win, good one for you, a good win for you. Uh, and I told you that that intro ends kind of abruptly. Uh, it's kind of like boom, <laughs> but we'll get used to it. Uh, uh, hey there, everyone! Welcome to the show. Uh, what we're going to be talking tonight is some sort, some kinds of of SHTF type stuff. Brian's got an article on SHTF supplies and gear. Uh, and before that, I wanted to kind of go into uh, uh, some of the stuff that is going on in Ukraine and all that. Seems like right when I started the stream, we're uh, I'm, we're buffering and all that crap. So I don't know what exactly is going. Dude, it looks good. <laughs> oh well, I guess. Uh, well, everybody. So that would be uh, Dale's stream just buffered and buffered. And Dale went away. So, hey, this is what we got going on in this show today. Dale actually puts the stuff together before the show. So we are going to talk about some spring prepping, and hopefully Dale will get back in here in just a second. We're also going to talk about some Ukraine lessons. Dale's been out digging up a whole bunch of information on Ukraine and what's happening with that there. And, hey, look at that. Dale's back. I don't know what just happened, but it was it's all foobar. So. I thought, but anyway, I, I no, couldn't hear you. Everything was frozen up on my end. Yeah, D D Dale, uh, Dale, we have had tech issues, everybody, just so you know. Like, I didn't even get my podcast out this week because my uh, Google crashed on me. It, it caused a bunch of my other stuff to crash. We've been on this for, well, we've been on about three hours today before this trying to get this tech working. So yeah. we're hoping it works. And, uh, yeah, let's see. So far, so good. Yeah, so far, so good. <laughs> I just checked everything up, but we'll see. Uh, for some reason... Um, maybe like go out and come back in. Cause on my end, your camera's frozen. I know it's not to everyone else, but, um, we can, I mean, uh, we can try I, to figure I, I, this out, but, but at any rate, yeah, it's going to be a good show. Once we get the whole ball rolling and everything, we're going to be talking about a lot of the stuff that's going on in Ukraine, how that's possible here in the United States, not necessarily, uh, you know, tanks and stuff like that going through, uh, but, uh, there's a lot of different scenarios where something like that could happen. So it uh, should be very, very cool. Uh, now we're on the, the wrong sides of the, the aisle. I'll switch us there. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it should be a, a very cool show tonight. Uh, and then before we get into that, I just wanted to mention, like, I, like last week with the chat, everybody, for some reason, Rumble's not working, but everybody from Facebook and, and Survivalist Prepper and all that should be able to see all this stuff. So uh, we should be uh, should be good to go with that. For some reason, Rumble's not working. I don't know why that is. Maybe they'll fix that. But uh, yeah. but very cool. Uh, but before we get into that, I was thinking about this this week, and I wanted to get your thoughts. You're you're uh, in a completely different situation than me, as mm -hmm. far as uh, like springtime and all that. Because with me being uh, in a one location, uh, it means basically time to put the the gloves on and get to work. With you, you've got that nomadic kind of lifestyle uh, where you're all over the place. Like when you're in Michigan and it gets cold up there, you're like, I'm out of here. <laughs> so what does it, the springtime, what what does that kind of trigger in you as far as preparedness or just in general? Uh, like it's time to get to work. That's what I feel anyway. Oh, I don't know about that, man. I mean, I, I stay in the warm. I've, I've been able to stay in the warm weather. So it's always kind of like you can do stuff, you know, Um I don't, I don't think it's about springtime. I think it's about like, I think it's the season of shit at the fan time coming up, maybe, you know? So that's yeah. what has me kind of motivated to look at stuff a little bit more. And actually, I mean, I, you know, a lot of the stuff I'm doing on my website right now is because I'm looking at stuff going, wow, man, maybe I need to go back through all this stuff and, you know, think everything through again and get a good look at, you know, where, where are we right now because of, I don't know. I, I don't see any slowing down in what's happening. So it's like, yeah, you better get ready because at some point, I think we're closer to the mirror go around stopping, you know, than ever before. So I don't, I don't think necessarily about seasons. I'm just like, man, prepare as much as you can. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, for me, it's it's time to get outside. There's there's like this list over the last few months that I've created because either one is an excuse or two, uh, it's you can't get out and do stuff because it's too cold. Everything's frozen. Yeah. Everything's under snow or whatever. So there's a list. I got trees that I need to chop up into firewood that one that fell uh, and it's just been sitting there. Uh, I've got some the chicken coop and the fence around it. I need to uh, re redo some of those. It's starting to fall apart, made out of wood. So, uh, and then How you know the it? picking up dog shit, all that stuff is, uh, and getting ready to garden is the main thing. So, it's a lot of stuff, but it's kind of good because you get out of the house. I don't have to get on the treadmill every day. Uh, I can actually get out and start working with my hands and. Uh, doing stuff i'm sure lisa's got do you get on the treadmill every day wait wait wait. back up do you get on the treadmill every day almost Um, yeah and not for not for like an hour at a time but i try to make sure that that we do yeah 30 seconds or what what are you talking no it's longer than that 15 20 minutes or whatever that's good you know, just get on it and, and just get some, because this is what I, I, I sit here almost, well, all morning long. Anyway, I sit in front of a computer, I'm mm-hmm. editing videos. I'm doing all sorts of different things. So this is what I'm doing most of the time. So, uh, I, I need to actually get up and, and force myself to do something. And in the winter time going outside, unless it's feeding the chickens or something like that, I'm not, I'm not all that inclined to do that. So uh, I need to get some exercise. Well, you know, there. shivering, shivering burns calories, right? So why don't you just go stand outside with the chickens? Not, you know, just go out there in your shorts and your t-shirt or whatever you wear or don't wear. It'll keep you in shape. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> not going to happen. So, uh, but at, at any rate, summertime offers me those opportunities. I got to, I got to, um, refill the pond i got to clean it out refill it and all that stuff so and then plant guarding the garden and all that what stuff you, we got what would you have to do to make your pond be able to like be a pond year round knowing that okay it might freeze oh it freezes over in the winter because there's uh, is there something you can do so that way it could be like something sustainable over the long term yeah i need to make it deeper uh, oh, okay. and that means taking the liner out that means getting a new liner and that's kind of expensive and then more rock and all sorts of different things i thought about that and then I decided that that wasn't going to happen this year because, yeah. um, you know, digging, that, all digging that it stuff deeper is called that preparing stuff, right? That'd be that rock and liners and stuff and making it deeper so it could be used year well, round. That's that whole preparedness thing. Considering it costs an arm and leg to fill up your yeah. gas tank and, and fill your refrigerator oh, yeah. and all I, that I crap. I can't imagine what all that stuff's going to cost. Well, I, you know what? That's money that needs to go into my refrigerator and not into right. a bunch of, uh, you know, a bunch of rocks. So. Uh, but at any rate, that's it's kind of uh, what I was thinking about all this stuff. Um, I haven't really been paying much attention to the chat. I'm sure Lisa's in there saying she's got a list for me and all that stuff and everybody else. But if you have There's anything no- in there, what are your plans for the springtime? I'm sure the people listening to this show, it's gardening. That's yeah. the main thing. Well, I, I think, too, if you think that we're on some sort of clock, right, that like the, the countdown is ticking, the timer's you know, we're heading towards the, some, you know, some sort of eventual outcome with the way we're heading and everything and that that may not be good. And it may entail, you know, food shortages and hyperinflation, which leads to food shortages and civil unrest and all that stuff. Well, then maybe this is like that, like your home stretch to get, get shit done before it turns bad. Right. Yeah. So I think, yeah. uh, I, I saw something and I'm, I'm going to do, it's actually what I'm going to record the podcast now that we're back up and running with everything, hopefully knock on wood. Um, and it was uh, a buddy, my cousin sent it to me and it was a bunch of prep. It's an epoch times. I'm not a big epoch times person, but it was um, a really good article, a bunch of different preppers like urban prepper and magic prepper and some others that they talked, you know, asking them what, what they thought. And they're all like, yeah, you better get ready. And then, yeah, it's just crazy. How, much how big the preparedness industry is coming. so many new people are coming into it and trying to get uh, information right now because more and more people are getting scared they're like yeah. oh yeah that preparedness thing maybe all those preppers aren't so crazy I, I can't tell you how many times i've heard that and and it while it should give you that yeah i told you so kind of feeling it doesn't mm. because um it, just the normal people um saying stuff like, like that Mm-hmm. is 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 more alarming to me than the thing or anything like that yeah it's, it's like, like 
it's like you like it's like the people that would normally they had to come kicking and screaming to be in their preparedness and hey great i'm glad that glad they're here and at the same time it's like you're kicking and screaming that means it's like gotten worse i guess in my mind so yeah yeah it's it's the same thing happened with the pandemic when when it's in their face and they know they have to do something about it Everybody, I mean, my stats went up on YouTube. My stats went up on the website. Everybody starts searching for that stuff. Everybody, for some reason, went after toilet paper and all that. So you can kind of you can kind of sense how the the public sentiment about all this crap just by yeah. how many people are actually getting into it. Probably happened during Y two K too. Oh yeah. Well, hey, speaking of pandemic, man, I was reading an article today, and I don't recall where it was. And it was of a guy, I think he's a Western dude, and he's in China, and he's in one of the cities that are locked down. And, like, you can't leave your apartment, and they're supposed to deliver food. He said he's been calling for two days and, like, you know, doing whatever the process is to get people to come deliver food, and they can't even get people to pick up the phones or, or respond to anything. Yeah. yeah. So. I, I just got an email from Legacy, too, uh, talking about how they're going to have to raise their prices. So, didn't they raise them a while back, too? They did in October, yeah, and now they're going to have to do it again. What was, because what was of, that? What was that increase in October? Do you recall? Remember? Um, I don't remember exactly what it was. I think it was like ten percent, something like that. Um, I haven't. I didn't look at the email. Um, I didn't look at the price list because I'm avoiding it. <laughs> I'm like, no, I don't want to do that. But Dude, it's, um, it's interesting, you know. There's, um, I don't buy. A, I'm a pretty like, I buy bags of fish and. Uh, you know, salad and like little uh, street tacos. And that's pretty much my diet. I pretty much eat the same thing every day. And, but I've noticed if, and because I eat such like, you know, like I don't have a big variety of stuff I eat. It's easy to pay attention to like the prices on stuff. And there's been a couple of things now where like, I don't know, a month or two ago, I was like, oh, wow, look at that thing just jumped in price. And now it's been like the second go around, just like legacy foods talking about, right? Where it's popped again. And it's like, oh. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, one thing, too, I forgot to mention in the beginning, we are going to be ending the, as usual, uh, we're going to be ending the, the live stream over at the Survivalist Prepper or the Survivalist Prepper YouTube channel a little bit before this one. Uh, like I said last week, we try to keep everything kind of calm in the beginning of this. Uh, and then after that, we, we tend to kind of let loose a little bit. So I uh, just want to know that as the public or the, uh, the show tonight, we are doing that Zoom call. I did send the email out to everyone, all the members. Uh, if you didn't get that, all you have to do is log in to the bug out location, go to your profile page, and then scroll down a little bit, and you'll see the backstage pass, the picture of the backstage pass, and just click on that link, and it'll it'll give you the link to the Zoom call. Um, that should be a lot of fun tonight. I figured we'd just do an open conversation tonight. Uh, it always ends up going one direction or another anyway, so I figure we'll let somebody... Uh, kind of pick a topic and we'll just run with it from that point on. So uh, should be a lot of fun though. Uh, we will be doing that uh, right after this this video is over tonight. Uh, but with that, I wanted to I wanted to go into a little bit about some of the stuff that is happening in Ukraine because I think it's a good lead in. You've got a really good article about essential gear for SHTF situations. And it's, it's all some of the basic stuff. But I think if we talk about the stuff that's going on in the Ukraine first, and, and maybe we don't see it, it um, unfold exactly like it is out there, but all these SHTF situations are sort of similar, right? As far as how they, I mean, what people end up doing. So it may not yeah, be tanks suck. on the ground. It may not be firefights and all that stuff, but you could still see some of those same, same types of situations, right? Well, in it, it well, I think when you get to that point where it's everything's, if you're talk, calling it an SHTF event, I think you get to that point where just there, there's nothing there, right? Society's gone mostly. And so, you know, what do you, what do you have on your hands? It's like what you see in Ukraine. We were talking about before the show, you know, the, it, it, it depends on what side you're getting the information from, but there's a lot of reports out that the Ukrainians are torturing Russian soldiers when they when they capture them, right? Uh, there's supposed video, and, and who knows if it's real or not, because there's so much fake information going around over there of, of the Russians yeah. um, getting some, Ru or of the Ukrainians pulling some Russian prisoners out of the back of the truck and, and shooting them in the legs. And then, and then other torture, uh, a doctor was talking about castrating all the, the Russians and supposedly said he gave the order to cat do that. 
So I think what it shows is when you get, get into that SHTF event, your, your biggest problem is people, right? Like, it, I mean, if, you, if you're a prepper and you've, you, you've stocked up on your food, I mean, you go through it, you know, okay, 2,000 calories a day. We all know the little mantra, you know, X number of cups of water per day and all that stuff. And so most preppers get a bunch of that stuff together. Well, then if you're set to stick around for a while, I think it's the man's inhumanity to man that's going on. That's yeah. happened, right? And so I, I think that's what, to me, what the, what the, first it's like, you know, Russia invading it over nonsense, us getting involved, getting stuff going over nonsense. And it's all, you know, all political stuff. And the people are the, 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 are caught in the middle and just every, you know, it's, it's just a really nasty, bad place to be. Yeah. And, and that's kind of what I want to talk about today is, being that, that average person that just wants to, you know, live your life and do that stuff and being stuck in the middle of this because of, you know, decisions that Putin made, decisions that the, you, you know, whatever all the stuff around the edges is, uh, they have to deal with this stuff. And I want to talk about how some of these situations, how, how maybe they might unfold here in the United States or, mm -hmm. or even Europe and other countries like, and, and stuff like that, but um, how those might, might look and I think you can take lessons from a situation like this as, as bad as it, bad as it is for them. Uh, we can take lessons from this it, because it just shows time and time again, how any type of situation like this, when it happens, how it it's almost the same. I mean, there might be differences here and there, but it's almost the same thing. Human, the human interactions, the, you know, humans, are, are just pieces of, of crap, basically, when it all comes down to it, without the rule of law, without the, you know, their moral compass goes to the wayside, uh, and they do what they have to do. Now, I'm not saying everybody is like that. There's probably a lot of people yeah. there just trying to survive. But there's a lot of people trying to take advantage. Uh, you talked about how you, you weren't sure, you can't, can't believe everything you see on the internet. I saw the same types of things, but they were talking about how the Ukrainians were basically duct taping people like traitors mm -hmm. or deserters mm -hmm. duct taping them to telephone poles uh and doing that and i was thinking well this is that's the mentality you get into of people but again like you said you just don't know what what's the truth is it is it they're doing well, it to russians or in my, my understanding of that when they say traitors it's people that they have over um that they're finding in some of the towns that don't speak I guess they don't speak Ukrainian. They're they're Russian only, because um, you Ukraine it's like fifty fifty Russian and Ukrainians. A lot of people speak both, and my understanding is that they were like cellophaning them and duct taping them to trees, and people are walking by and punching them. Right again, it's it's about you know humans inhumanity to you know one another, man, and it it's real easy to get going, right? Like they're over there seeing a lot of like they're seeing their friends get killed by Russians. Yeah. So it's real easy to get pissed off and, and want to, you know, just like, and, and that region of the world for a long time has been known for that. Really the whole world's been known for that. Right. Like just be doing really evil shit to, to individuals. And so, um, yeah, I think it goes, it's like that article, um, that I did on the bugging in thing, right? Your, your plan should probably, if you don't have a place to go, a bug out place to go, um, or evacuation place to go, whatever you want to call it, and a plan, um, then your plan should be to fortify your home and make that thing like as impenetrable as possible. Because yeah. it, you're, if you're, if things are going bad and you're out on the road, well, there's all kinds of problems, right? And then, you know, if you don't have, if you don't really have the ability to, to fortify your bug out location too, you know, or whatever you, your, your vacation home and all that. I, I think that's the biggest thing right now, seeing that, you know, I don't think our society is, is far in a way. I mean, look, look at the riots last or, you know, the last summer, or the summer before, right. We're, we're not that far away from the police, not, and, and, and the, and what we have being able to keep anything under control. And then if they're not allowed to control it, you know, and, and your home is in that area where they just let them go, you know, let people go, fucking nuts right like you know again like hey i think we're all about protests i think a lot right you know there's a lot of people that want to protest right now but like with and with the riots but they let that stuff happen well if they're not gonna if, if the supreme court ruled they haven't they're not duty bound to protect you they don't have any legal requirement to protect you you have to protect yourself and 
that's fortifying your house. And with everything going on, I think that would be one of your big preps you can do right now. You talk about that spring stuff, well, include working on your house, getting the stuff squared away in case pretty soon you end up in some level of, you know, going from a permissive environment to a non-permissive environment. And you can't go out to get groceries without running a huge risk. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, also with that, um, in, in on the Ukraine thing, um, there, you know, you, you just because you see on the news all the time how oh, I, you, I stand for Ukraine and and everybody's rah rah and rightfully so, I suppose. Um, you're rooting for them and and Putin to just get annihilated, but it doesn't mean that everybody there is on the right side. Uh, every, I mean, there's a lot of white nationalists out there. There's a lot. There's groups out there that are potentially doing shit like this. So when these the civilians the regular civilians are at their weakest they're the ones taking advantage of situations like this and it's not just ukraine those people are here in the united states too those people are at, down in australia out in england all that stuff so when there's opportunity i think that's something that we need to uh, pay attention to with opportunity for somebody to do something I, I mean i think that's what as preppers we do right we pay attention to that we know that if things were to go sideways uh, that we do need to be on alert for those those people that are it's just the other countries and all that. It's not just the government that you've got to worry about. It's the other people too. Uh, it could turn out to be kids. I mean, that that sounds a little bit you know far fetched to a lot of people. Preppers, it's absolutely right uh, because it absolutely one hundred percent could happen. Think about how you react. When and I don't know how long you've ever gone uh, unintentionally uh, with eating, but if you've ever gone even a day, <laughs> it becomes all you can think about, right? Dude, I think I went through when I when I was in the military. I went three or four days without eating one time, and we we just didn't get resupplied, and uh, we ended up finally what we ended up getting was they I think they called them a rats. They were like uh, they were rations that came in like a big aluminum pan that they would heat up. And it was eggs and sausage and eggs. And it was frozen. And we didn't have any way to heat it up. We're not lighting a fire out in the woods. So you just chunk off a piece of egg and you throw it in your mouth and you let it sit there until it warmed up enough to where you can you eat it, you know. And but after three got three days of not eating, I was pretty you get pretty hungry, man. And you yeah. know, I and I don't even know that it's getting through three days of not of not eating that starts and that will with some people. But you get to the point where you realize, like, if I don't eat soon, I'm going to get weak and die. Right? And so at that point, it's like, I got to get food. And there's some people that, you know, are willing to try to figure out and eat leaves and do stuff so they don't have to be a jack wagon. And then there's people who are willing to come and kick in your front door and take it from you. And if you get in yeah. the way of them, they'll, you know, they're willing to, you know, take, take you out of the picture. Yeah. And then you get those people, maybe it's a neighborhood or, you know, a, a group of people that get together and talk each other into doing something re stupid like that. Uh, you've got to watch out for people like that, too. So it's not just the, you know, the large stuff, the, you know, the the guys with the big bad tanks and all that stuff. It could be, uh, you know, just, you, you know, somebody in a neighboring neighborhood or something like that. So uh, it just it it made me think about all the different things, how that could happen here. Now, I don't think that uh, there'd be some sort of invading force. I just don't, I mean, maybe, I, I suppose, I, I, I guess never say never, but that would be a tough battle. You look at how hard Ukraine is fighting. Can you imagine uh, the people that we have here, the mentality of Americans, what that I, would look like? Good luck, I think. <laughs> I think there's too many ways that people and, and countries through the internet, through food, through supply chains and everything that nowadays can manipulate popular. If they truly want to sh like invade and take over a country, I think Russia was, is like, Russia is showing everybody like the technology, what the technology is going to be going down the road, right? Like literally the, the, the problem the Russians have is we flooded all these little man pads, these portable um, air, you know, uh, like Stinger missiles, air defense missiles, and these portable uh, anti-tank missiles. They're just pumping those in out there. They got, go look up the switchblade drone. 
that, that we pumped in over there, right? It's like a tube of like PVC, maybe a f foot, foot and a half, something like that, two feet long at the most and about five, six inches round. Put it down the ground, it launches a drone in the air and it flies around and it spies on everything. It's like a 25-mile like a radius or something like that. And it's a warhead. So if it sees, it sees a target opportunity, a person, a truck, blows it up. And they, yeah. so they're using drones all over the place. The Russian army just ran it. Is This is like the uh, what you're seeing with the Russian army is like the um, machine gun in World War I. World War I was so deadly because they kept using the same tactics, and they had invented the machine gun. And so they would just get up and mass you know, human wave in, across the uh, no man's land going after their trench, and they just run into machine gun fire and mow everybody down. What you're yeah. seeing is the same thing right now. The Russian military is still using, you know, 20 year old plus you know world war ii and on it, we have the same problem these, these gigantic tactics of big tanks and all this bullshit and you know you have a million dollar i don't know what a, a t-72 runs or any of the, the tanks that they have over there but you run this ex very expensive tank and we for fractions of the cost we put an anti-tank missile and that some guy can carry and take out your tanks Though you're seeing warfare change, and now you think about the technology, and as that becomes more available to people and governments to use, I I think we're heading down a really bad path because government hasn't governments haven't proven. The more we get technology that can cause us problems, the more the governments are using it. It's not like the governments are saying, "Hey, let's give everybody freedom and not snoop and do all this stuff." Every time new technology comes out, they're clamping onto it and it and it's eroding all of our freedoms. So I don't think they can come if if they can't come back off that edge, it's either it total totalitarianism because we won't be able to get out from under the weight of the technology, or at some point everything's gonna pop. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's what I think is more likely. Maybe they don't put boots on the ground here, or if they do, it's it they're not gonna be very successful, but that doesn't mean they won't. But it's all that other stuff that may happen beforehand. I'm surprised there hasn't, and I don't know, maybe there has been in the Ukraine. I'm surprised there hasn't been more uh, cyber stuff going on. Uh, out here, you know, if China were involved, I guarantee you they're a lot more sophisticated than Russia is. So a lot of that stuff would be happening. And that stuff would affect uh, our daily lives. And I think that's the type of stuff we need to be watching out for mm -hmm. is that stuff that indirectly affects our ability to do what we're doing it indirectly affects our ability to work uh, get light get gas you know all of that stuff well the problem is it's we're so entwined with the technology right now and so dependent on a lot of ways you know canada's trying i, I want to say it was like c11 it's some innocuous it was uh richard brand was talking about it today um c11 bill or something like that it's like some innocuous sounding boring sounding bill and it's literally to give like the government to create an agency to um censor the censor free speech so that it so yeah, that there's figure. you know basically what it determines you know it's like oh we don't want to we want we need somebody to monitor and control hate speech yeah and what they're saying is if we hate your speech we want to control it it's not hate speech it's if they hate it yeah 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 um so it, it's just all it, it's it's you know, I, I, like I said, I don't see something like that coming here, like a Mad Max type situation. That's something that, uh, but I think in, in Europe, what like an SHD I think there, there's a, you mean, or or the level of control that they're that they keep create going the type for. of what, military action, I suppose, that's going on oh, okay. over there. Uh, I I could see maybe that happening yeah. in other places in Europe. No, uh, I, I I couldn't see something like in in Australia. You know, I don't see anybody going there and trying to do that. Why, I guess, would be the reason. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I, I don't think you'll see that. I think I think more you'll see just, I don't know, for some reason I envision something along the lines of the, the Hunger Games where the, 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 the cities consolidate and try to do what they can, import food, do what they can to support themselves, and kind of like everybody else ends up in a, you know, no support and, you know, like figure it out. I don't know. Yeah. A, a couple of other things with this, too, is I was thinking about ham radio communications. So if you're one of these just average Joe trying to, you know, get by until all of this stuff is over, maybe you're not in Kiev or in some of the hot spots, right? You are on the outskirts where you're, you know, you're thinking about, hey, is it likely that some 
some of this stuff is going to be coming towards me. Uh, is it what do I need to do? What I need to prepare in advance? Maybe you were on the outskirts and the electricity has been cut off because, you know, the um, the the places got bombed and stuff like that. Maybe the water's out, all of that stuff. So you have to figure out. Um, and this kind of goes into your article we're going to talk about here in a second, too, is you, you have to figure out maybe how to travel to go get water and how to do that safely, because who knows what you're going to encounter on the road just going to get that stuff, right? Or maybe, you know, being able to have um, a way to communicate, because right now I'm sure anybody hearing anything in the Ukraine is probably all propaganda, telling them we're, we're, we're fighting the good fight, we're doing this, we're doing that. And, you know, maybe that's, you know, rightfully so, I suppose. But um, ha being able to get correct information would be super important in a situation like this. You know, our government's going to lie to us. See, I wouldn't say rightfully so. I, I'd say, you know, we are everybody should be entitled to accurate information because if, if you're if you're if you're, you know, should be. hiding the information, if you're trying to spin the information, then you have an angle. Right. Like you don't trust people. You either don't like the information it doesn't doesn't support your views or you don't trust people with the information or both. So, you know, it, we, that's the, the, the beauty of the Internet should have been that we should everybody should be able to go get the information they want and and that it shouldn't be censored. We, we should all be able to make our own judgments about it. I mean, but they that's that's where they're coming up. Like they don't trust us with the information or the information doesn't suit their narrative. And, I, you know, yeah, yeah. They, they want to push an idea. They want to push that, that morale across the. Oh, hey, there went Dale again. But yeah, um, I think he'll be back in just a second. <laughs> and, and now his head's popping. Look, now he's looking. Here's his eyes shifting, looking at all his little screens. Because he has a laptop, everybody. He has a laptop sitting up here that he's looking at that he jerry-rigged now. So now he's looking at everything. Oh, there he went again. But yeah, I think um, I think it's an important time. I think I think we I think the world is changing the way conflict happens now. You have individual people able to take out. We you saw it in Iraq. M1 Abrams that roll out of a gate and they get hit by a not very expensive explosive charge. Take out the tank, a shape charge. Send out the reaction force, which is another M1 Abrams. They took out that. You know, you're, you're take it's not sustainable for these big countries, man. So I think, I think we're moving into a new age, dude. Yeah. All right. I'm going to, I'm not going to lose it. I'm not going to do what everybody thinks I'm going to do and freak out. <laughs> it's technology, man. Just going to roll with it. I'm going to end up buying a damn new computer. I talked about in the beginning how I didn't want to spend a whole bunch of money digging a pond and all that. I'm not going to have a choice. Hey, but. man, when, once you go Mac, you won't go back. <laughs> um, I got to figure something out. Uh, we do this twice a week, so I, I got to figure something yeah. out. But at any rate, um, I, I wanted to get into your article a little bit. Uh, one thing also that uh, I wanted to remind people about, too, this, this really reminds me of Selko's experience in the Balkans. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's talked about that a couple times. He was on the Spearco podcast uh like over a decade ago, I had him on my podcast. If you go to survivalistprepper.net uh, and just type in Selco, uh, you can listen to that podcast I did with him. But he was talking about um, how that, that was basically siege warfare. And that's kind of in, in some places in the Ukraine, that's what's going on. They're just surrounding them. And it's almost, you know, in that article that you wrote, I read um, you were talking about bugging in. It's that same principle. That was a great analogy, I thought. It's that same principle of if if you're if you're in under siege, basically, and now they're being under siege by the the Russians, the the, the point of that is just to to hold out to to be able to hold out longer than you can. So as mm -hmm. preppers, we think if, if we think it, you'll have to explain this, but if we think about bugging in as being under siege, how long can we hold out? And that's kind of the whole point of that, right? Well, you you run into a co I mean, security and logistics, right? I mean, you, you look at if you want to talk about a great siege to look at, look at the Battle of Bastogne in World War II, right? When the 101st Airborne was surrounded, right? They it be, for them it became a matter of time. 
that they had, there was cloud cover. They couldn't get resupplied and they had just the, the people they had on the ground. So part of the deal was there, they couldn't get supplies into them. So they were running out of all their equipment. They, they were in a rear area. They weren't supposed to be in combat. So they didn't, you know, they're supposed to be back there chilling out from all the combat. Next thing you know, they're in the middle of a, 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 a crazy storm. So I, I think you can look at it like that. Like all of a sudden the world went bad around them and all they had is what they had. Right? You had guys that didn't have winter coats. You had people that didn't have ammo, people that didn't have, you know, the right footwear, what, whatever the case may be, they caught, got caught flat footed. And that shows like what happens if you're, you know, not prepared, then you have to be prepared for the security, right? Like you can have all the stuff in the world, but if you don't have a plan on how to, to truly need to defend it or, you know, go through the five D's of security, you know, detect, delay, deter, deny, all that kind of stuff. Um, to make sure your house is uh, as low key as possible and as safe and secure and possible, you know it's it's. I talk about it a lot with the the whole my survival pyramid or survival rule of threes. Right, you need to plan for sleep. Well, if it's just you and your wife and a couple of kids, if you go to bed at night and things are bad outside. Well, you don't have any awareness if somebody's coming up on your house. So if you really want to be safe, then you want somebody up 24-7 to, you know, keep an eye on what's happening around the house, around the neighborhood and everything else. So there's a lot, there's a lot that goes into it, man. But you're right. It's, it's like siege warfare. If you're, if you, things are bad and everything's bad outside, the only place that you have that you can guarantee as much as possible, your security and your safety, that's inside your house. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, TSP was saying in the chat. Uh, I said, move the show to ham radio when the S hits the fan. Uh, and then White Rabbit said in there, also Liberated Lady said, I'm wearing my Metallica hat again. <laughs> but uh, White Rabbit said, can you imagine this show being broadcast on the open air airwaves on ham radio? The only way that would be possible is if it was an SHTF situation because we'd be getting the FCC banging on our doors right? Uh, if we broadcast this show over the open airwaves. <laughs> that would be pretty interesting. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, uh, back onto what you were talking about. Yeah, it's, it, it is that, that type of, of stuff that's, that could happen. Now you think about what, what would cause that here in the United States? Again, it wouldn't be, I don't think a military power possibly, but, but probably not. But if it were some situation, it was a hyperinflation situation without rule of law, everything just kind of devolved. Maybe your little neighborhood or, or something like that could you know, devolve into a situation where there were people that just had you locked down in your, uh, in your neighborhood until, uh, you know, I, I don't know, there's a uh, hundred different reasons why they would do something like that and why they wouldn't, but yeah, um, well, it, it is possible here. So part of the problem with the whole siege warfare thing for the people that are bugging in or whatever, you know, sheltering in place is you, unless you have like a secret tunnel, or some sort of, you know, magic carpet to get you out of there. Once you do that, you could be locked. Like, that's it. Like, you have no other options because now you can't leave. You know, if, if, the, if a, a city melts down uh, to the point where things are really that bad, where there's crazy violence all over town and, there's, and, and no one has food, and so there's just, you know, nuts, nutso stuff going on, like putting your family out in that might be a really hard, difficult thing. You know, you yeah. may be putting them like that may be a lot of risk to assume like, but then maybe it gets so bad that like, that's your only option. Well, then it's like, okay, how do you minimize the risk when you get out of there? Right. Leave at night, have some routes planned to take you through, you know, you know, different routes, different areas, you know, try to get out of where it's, you know, people have less ability to see, but th there's a whole lot of problems that come if things don't get better. Maybe you can weather it out till everybody around you is pretty much just died off or gone away, you know, but that would be, you're talking, if, if the, if the grid came down to a screeching halt, you're talking, you know, probably a, a couple months in the big cities to get to that point. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, 202 said, uh, uh my block in DC is strapped. That's almost an oxymoron. DC. <laughs> I mean, uh, I know there's, you know, there's guns everywhere, but, uh, you know, I don't think of, uh, very, uh, dude, it's, lax. it's, it, it's the, um, you had DC, you have the, uh, it's the capital of the country with more law enforcement agents and everybody and, yeah, and, and military bases. And then, you know, and, and then if they're in, in bad parts of DC or a lot of that's, you know, different parts of Maryland and stuff now, 
dude, like it's not like the a lot of those gang gang dudes and and you know those guys are not armed. So yeah, there's a lot of guns in that area. And Virginia is a very pro gun. You know, maybe not Northern Virginia got some problem. You know, problems with it up there. But Virginia, by and large, is very pro gun, and it's easy to get a concealed carry permit there. So yeah yeah not like it's new york or california or anything like that yeah true and i forgot you you were out there for a while so um all right so i want to get to your article now uh talking about the essential gear for shtf i hope you have this pulled up because if my internet goes down again you're gonna have to screen share it um but i want to pull this up and uh talk about some of the some of the stuff you have in this article now it's, it's kind of a long article, so we don't have to go through the entire thing if you don't want, uh, but it's a really good article. I do have the link below uh, if everyone, if you guys want to read it later on or whatever. Very good article. But you talk about basically, and I'll just show this table of contents here. Um, you talk about basically how um, all of these things, it, it's kind of general, but it's all of these things that are going to be important. Uh, regardless what the situation is, correct? I mean, just mm -hmm. you're, you're talking an SHTF situation. Yeah, I think, you know, you have to look at it, man. We, well, one, we always look at it as gear. You know, that's part of it, right? What do you, and, and getting different perspectives on the gear that you might need and, and all that. But also, you know, um, going through it and, and, and when you when you look at your gear, getting stuff in a, in a manner that uh, makes sense for you and doesn't break the budget, so you get the best value, you know, for your dollar. It's like it's like why well, I like those Maracaniv niv knives. Where are they? Out of Sweden or Denmark or something like that. The ones on Amazon. Those are great. Those are great little knives, and they're not expensive, but they're solid. They're well built. You know, some of them come with ferro rods and all that. So like that's a great piece of kit in, in my mind. And so looking at stuff like that to, um, because in that SHTF of event, if you do have to leave your house, you have to go out or you know you. You can't go to the hardware stuff store anymore. Having multi-purpose stuff is, is, I think that's you know, I think that's huge. Yeah, yeah, and I, I like this this image you've got right here. What is an SHTF kit? You got Plan A, Plan B, real life, and no plan. Uh, and that is that. I think that's pretty accurate because we all think our Plan A, right? This is this is going to work great. You know, it's going to work awesome. Kind of like me and the internet uh, and, and streaming, live streaming. Then you got plan B. Um, my, my plan B usually turns into that, that fourth one on that analogy, but it, but it's true. You've got to be, be ready to adapt to all this stuff. And that's why, like you were talking about with the multi-tool stuff and multi-use items, that's why all that stuff is important because while you may have a, this plan for something, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's a plan for a tool or this is what I'm going to use this for, or this is how this situation is probably going to go down. You really have no idea. And maybe, you know, you're using the tools differently than you thought you would, or you're going to need something. You're going to need to improvise. So all yeah. of that stuff is is super important. Yeah, well, I think I, I kind of, when I see that, and uh, I look at the no plan, and I kind of think the no plan is more like real life, right? For a lot of people. Yeah, until, uh, like you were talking about earlier, until things start to get bad, and then all of a sudden they're looking at all the prepping websites and trying to f trying to figure out a plan when it's too late. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so what I want to do, I, I want to break down a few of these um, that you have on this list. The first one here, let me scroll down here, personal defense items. Uh, so with this one, it, the first part, you you talked about mindset, having the plan and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then the next part is those those personal defense items. Is is it Was it intentional that you made this first on your list or... Uh, is this in in no certain order, basically? No, I think it needs to be. I, th I think it needs to be first because one, you have the mindset right, and when you go into a situation, the only things that you have to react right when the situation happens are what's in your head, what do you have pre-planned, and what are in your hands, right? If it's not in your hand right when something happens, you know, maybe it's like if you have a concealed carry holster. Well, now you're going for something that's that seconds that takes time. And if you don't, and if you're, if you become aware of a situation, right. When somebody's about ready to do something, maybe that's too much time. So then it's like, okay, maybe I have a little bit of time to, to now I get my pistol out or I get my knife or I get my stick, you know, whatever the case may be. I think you have to defeat the, the most immediate threats that can come at you, right? Like you're not going to freeze to death in a second. If you are, well, then we got bigger problems in the world, right? That that's one of those 
movies at end of the world movies. So I I like having personal defense items up first because that's your, your greatest threat is, is another person that can instantaneously end your life. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, real quick. Angelo said, uh, uh, plan a, uh, a well laid, laid out plan, plan a one throw away plan (laughs) a, uh, because it went sideways. So, yeah. Um, oops, I hit the wrong button. That was a good comment too. I just don't feel like reading it. Uh, two Oh two. I've given you enough airtime. <laughs> um, all right. So you, you talk about some weapons in here that I want to go through real quick. Um, your SHTF gear. So you've got knives. Uh, that's what you were just talking about. The Morikov knife. Uh, you've got uh, the multi-tool again. Um, you know, there's, there's probably any, any one of those those little tools on there could actually be used as a weapon. Well, you know, you know what I love about the Swiss system. Army knife? They make small versions that have just a couple of gizmos on it that fit well in your pocket. And yeah. It slides well in your pocket. So we're like a normal multi-tool Leatherman stuff. You kind of, you're putting that in your pocket. It's like pulling down on your pants or whatever, and you, you know, or you got to put it on a belt. So I, I still like the Swiss Army knife. I think they, they ser- uh, serve a really good purpose. Yeah. Uh, some of those on that Swiss Army knife, like the corkscrew, I, I can do without that. The pair of scissors that, that you're not Harley a wine works. drinker, dude. <laughs> uh, I'm going to figure I I've, I've had to figure out how to get a cork out of a bottle before, and you can use a, a screw and you just need a little bit of ingenuity. It's purpose built. See, there you go again. There you go again. Making, making I'm up in an SHTF situation. There's good stuff to use, man. I'm, I mean, let's say we're in a situation we were talking about earlier. It's an, it's a hyper, hyper inflation, it, it, Mad Max type situation in the United you're States. You're out having I a romantic travel. dinner with Lisa and you have a bottle of wine. <laughs> I need to travel a mile and a half to go get, you know, fill up some water. I'm on my horse uh, going down the river to fill up some buckets of water. There's no situation I can think of that I would need a corkscrew <laughs> in in those situations. And you know what? If, if it's a bottle of wine, we're busting the top off of it. And we're see right there. There, the there you go. There's a situation. And you never know. I mean, that's all you got left to drink. Uh, Liberated lady said uh, uh, in the chat, she See? said uh, corkscrews are essential. I suppose <laughs> exactly. maybe maybe to some people, they absolutely are. To me, it's just not, not something I'll have here. Uh, but at any rate, along those same lines, it, I, my, the reason I went through that little tirade, because I was going to mention that I've got a knife, a uh, fishing knife that I use in my tackle box. That is, it's got three blades on it, basically. It's got one big blade, it's got a smaller blade, and then it's got a really small blade. That thing is awesome. Um, so you don't need all the the fancy crap. Maybe a little screwdriver head or whatever, but I don't know. To each their own. It, I don't, I it, does it have a corkscrew? <laughs> no, it doesn't have a corkscrew. And it's not awesome. I, I've, I've, never, I've never been sitting on a lake fishing, and all of a sudden up floats a bottle of wine or a message in a bottle or something that I got to open. It's never happened. Yeah, well... So. I try bringing it with you and forgetting the corkscrew. <laughs> All right. Anyway, back on to weapons. We're, we we got a 15-minute segment on corkscrews going here. Uh, but back on weapons, you talked about knives. We've talked about multi-tools and all that. You've got axes, yeah. firearms. We we talked about that. We talk about that all the time. But uh, uh, firearms, how many guns is too many? We've had that conversation. Uh, it, there, there, there's no such thing. <laughs> Blasphemy. Uh, so the next one you have here is first aid kits, right? Um, and I think this one is, is overlooked a lot, uh, because people just kind of tend to have their, it, maybe not a kit. Maybe they have in their closet, they have their band-aids, they have their Neosporin, they have their, and Lisa's going to kill me for saying Neosporin, but, um, they have all their essentials. Lisa not really Neosporin a kit. Neosporin in the house? No, we don't. Oh. <laughs> I guarantee you we don't. And and usually when I need something like that, I ask her anyway. So yeah. uh, she's got her big red EMT bag that's just loaded with crap. So, that's awesome. but anyway, explain the the first aid kit and um, not just having the stuff, but also knowing how to use that stuff, right? Yeah, of course. I mean, I think mindset again. Mindset's the foundation of all your preparedness, right? So even if you go online and and watch other people do it on YouTube videos. There's value in that, right? Like, if, mm-hmm. and then watch them, and then go do it yourself. Take a stop the bleed course. Go do a CPR course, because remember, and it's what we talk about all the time with the survival pyramid, right? Like, at this point, if you can keep your a family members keep their their squash, keep their brain oxygenated, 
that's the next big hurdle to overcome, right? Three minutes without air to the, or oxygen in the brain, you, you start having problems. So being able to throw a tourniquet on to stop bleeding because you can bleed to death in just a couple of minutes and being able to uh, do CPR and keep respirations going. And then after that, I mean, the tourniquet's easy. Get a real tourniquet. Again, don't go buying tourniquets off Amazon. Go to North American Rescue or any of the other places that, that have their own tourniquets and buy them there so you don't get a counterfeit. But then having general first aid stuff, right? Like, uh, man, if you're, if you're planning on like getting locked in your house for a while, you should probably have some stuff if you get the bubbly guts. You know, you should probably have some stuff for cuts and scrapes and all those, the colds, the flu medicines and, and all that. Stock up on it. You have your house. It's like the, it's the biggest prepper storage locker you can have. So, you know, put, use it, use it to your advantage. Yeah. Hey, I knew Lisa was going to say this. She said in the chat, Neosporin is the devil. Now, for everybody, I, I've we've mentioned this a few times, but it's been a long time, so I just want to explain why um, Lisa says that and why um, I say it too, uh, basically because Lisa has, has trained me to say that. But um, it's because it's it's that triple antibiotic. So it's, it's that shotgun approach to uh, treating an infection, which is all fine and good, I suppose, but it also leads to you becoming more resistant or people in general becoming resistant um, to Neosporin and stuff like that. Um, she recommends Silvazorb gel. Um, that is pretty hard to get unless you're in the medical community, but there are other options. Silver gel, um, silver, I, I don't know. You you had found something that was a little bit less expensive, right? Um, that is kind of the, it, it does the same thing, but it's not. Yeah, I mean, you can go to bucks. Amazon and look up any of the, um, any of the silver based gels and stuff like that. They work great. They're, they're awesome. And Hey, just so everybody knows, in case you don't know, Dale's wife, Lisa, uh, is a wound care nurse, right? So this is what she does for a living. Yeah. So she, she can't stand the asporin. So look at the yeah, silver. She's not just, the, the she's not just a loud form. mouth. She actually yeah. knows what she's talking about. <laughs> Um, all right. So, um, with this, we've talked about general first aid stuff and, um, uh, understanding, uh, what you have understanding how to use it and when it'll be appropriate. Then you've got protective gear and clothing. Um, uh, and this is, uh, basically I, I'm not going to read this right now, but basically with this, you're talking about being prepared, um, for whatever elements those might be. So here in Colorado, it's a little bit more challenging because we've got the changing seasons and all of that stuff. So it may be the summertime. I need, may need to be um, trying to protect myself from extreme heat, whereas in the wintertime, it's the opposite. It's the, the extreme cold. Uh, explain what you were talking about with protective gear and clothing. Yeah, I mean, it's your your clothes are your, and what you wear. That's your armor, right? That's like a – it's a passive protection. It's all well, – it's kind of like an active and passive progression. It's always on. You know, if you're wearing your clothes, it protects you against scrapes and cuts and all that. If you're wearing body armor, it protects you against whatever, you know, bullets and knives or whatever. So it, having whatever you have on you, that's what you need to protect you from the environment, right? The, the, not just heat and cold, but you know, go, go sit down in a field down south and get eaten up with fire ants. You need to protect yourself from the ants and the mosquitoes. If you, Like, I'm allergic as hell to mosquitoes, and, and mosquitoes – when I walk outside, they ring the dinner bell, right? So I need I I plan every my everything that I have when it comes to like stuff in the truck, stuff in like a bug out bag, all that stuff. I pack tons of insect repellent because they eat me up so bad. So understanding what you need to do to protect yourself from from Mother Nature is is really big. And like you with the you know the, the winter time and the, you know, you're dressing for the cold summertime for the heat. Have layers, you know, pack that stuff in your truck, your car, or wherever you're at, and be able to ratchet it up and down. Yeah, and in, in, in an SHTF situation, you don't know what's coming, you know, today, tomorrow, the next day. I mean, it, it all could change. Uh, it could be you're on, like I was talking about, being on a horse, going to, on a trip to get a bucket of water or, or fill up some water and get stuff like that. It could be a situation where uh, something happens on that trip. Maybe maybe you're out for a day or something that's going to take six hours. You need to have the stuff ready and, and uh, be prepared for whatever situation might come up. So if that means yeah. having stuff in your bag, um, that extra clo clothing, like you were talking about, wearing layers, all that stuff. So Well, and yeah. you think about it too. If you go out, if you leave, it's a, if it's an SHTF event and you, and you fortified your home and you have that all set to go, really your biggest threat then is – every time you leave, every time you leave, that's a risk. It's like when I was doing 
diplomatic protection in Iraq. Like we, we had our reaction plans that you rehearsed and all the stuff you did on, on the little uh, embassy compound we were at. Right. And, and we had a guard force there. Like if, if the knuckleheads wanted to come in and try to take us over it, like they were going to have, a, it was going to be a long day. But the minute you have to leave, when we had to take somebody somewhere, now it's all on there. Like it's, it's in their country, you know, world. So that's when it gets dangerous. So anytime you have to leave your house, that's, it's not just like, Hey, I'm going over here. If it's an SHTF event, that becomes like a, a, a mission. Like you have to plan that. Like, all right, we're going here. Here's our routes. If this happens, you know, we could, we call them actions on contact, right? You know, somebody hits you in, in route. What is your plan? Why like, we're driving? What are we going to do? You know, we're, we're at past a certain point. Here's where we're going. If we're not to this point, when something happens, we're going back to the house, you know, all that kind of stuff to think about knowing who's in what vehicle or um, where, when you get there, all right, here, we're, we're going to go in the grocery shop store, right? If, if there's, if there's food riots, you don't just want to like, oh, I'm just going to go to the grocery store and walk in. No, because there's going to be pissed off people possibly. So yeah. you want to plan. Like when we, this is where we're going to park. Someone's going to watch the car. Ideally have two people to watch the car. You never want to leave someone by themselves. And then the people that are going to go into the store, this is how we're going to go into the store. And when we come back, this is how we're going to load the stuff and get out of here. And this is the way back. Like every degree of that should be planned. If it's truly an SHTF event, because Again, you're locking yourself in your house and fortifying it because things are so bad. Yeah. Hey, uh, Frost said in the in the chat, uh, he said everything happens when you least expect it, and I think yeah. that's that's just a good mantra to have for an SHTF yeah. event that's altogether good. with all of this stuff. So, uh, yeah. Uh, with that, uh, let me um, let me get that out of the way here. Uh, with that, let's move on to the next one. And the next one you've got here is shelter. Uh, let's go through both of these. You've got shelter and water because shelter is pretty basic. Shelter is making sure like in your bug out bag, if you're on, again, I'm going to use that trip to go pick up water or trip to go get resources. If it's going to be a half a day trip, making sure and having that stuff with you just in case something does happen, like Frost was just saying. Um, and also shelter is making sure like you were talking about with my part of my springtime plan should be um looking around the house and make sure it's fortified and everything is is good to go yeah. uh, but that is shelter as well so not just having that tent in your bug out bag or that that stuff like that but also where you're living right now and and all of that goes into security and and not just having the roof over your head and keeping dry uh, yeah there's a whole lot more to it I think you can look at shelter as like an extension of your clothes, right? Extension of what you're wearing, your everyday carry kit, right? Like, I mean, if, if your clothes, like you're wearing a coat, you're wearing body armor, right? And, and like boots and socks and gaiters or heavyweight pants so they don't get cut up. You're protecting your body from cuts, scrapes. You know, you got, you've got body armor, you're protecting it from assault, right? It's, and so if you look at your, at your house or your shelter, it's the same thing. Maybe it's a tent. What are you trying to do? You're trying to protect yourself from the weather. You're trying to protect yourself from the, the things that are crawling on the ground. And then, you know, have that mindset that, all right, if my clothes get to the point where they can't protect me, maybe from the cold or the heat, whatever it is, then you need some shelter to extend that, to extend your protection. Yeah. And also comfort. I mean, yeah. if you're talking about sleeping on the ground out in a tent or whether you, you know, if you know how, if you got the skills, some bushcraft stuff where you can actually make some bedding. Uh, mm -hmm. where you're going to get a good night's sleep, all that stuff. So, yeah, comfort yeah. It also plays a factor in that. Uh, with the water section, you've got water and also water purification. And I think this is one that it's it's really simple, but uh, it, when people first get into preparedness, there there's a lot more to it that people need to understand than just it, because it really does seem simple. Hey, I get a Sawyer, Sawyer Mini or I get a life straw and then I can drink any water on the planet. I'm good to go throw one of those in my bug out bag. I'm good to go. So, and, and also water, I think people underestimate the amount, right? I mean, it's going to take a lot of water for a long time. I mean, depending on how long this stuff goes. So uh, did you pull up the wrong comment there? <laughs> I did. I hit the wrong button, man. Oh, I did the same thing. Yeah. It's hard to, yeah. yeah well, and I, I think water purification, right? I mean, that, if you get to the point where you don't have water, then, you know, like at any one time, if you have your water supply, you get to the point where, you know, three days without water, right? So like, 
as soon as you get down to the point where you don't have three days without water, you're, you're on the clock. And, you know, it's like the place where I'm staying in Vegas right now. It has like a tankless water heater. So you don't even have the luxury of the extra 30 gallons of water that you would have in a, in a water heater if the water here ever shuts down. And so, so understanding how are you going to get water? And then when you get it, like, hey, making sure it's, it's, it's squared away, you know, like down in Haiti when they had the earthquake, you know, whatever it was 20 years ago, 15 years ago. Like one of the problems after was the UN went in there and they, they didn't do a great job at what they were doing. So they had a bunch of sewage and stuff end up in the water supply. And there's a huge cholera uh, epidemic that broke out, right? So being able to make sure you purify your water, last thing you need to do is, is get the bubbly guts, man. When I was in Africa, that would put people down for days. You know, yeah. like you're just, you're, you're miserable and you're not performing. And then now you're talking about, okay, where you, it, how are you, how are you rehydrating yourself? Right. So you gotta, you gotta make sure you take care of that water. Yeah. And, and the other thing with water too, is understand, I mean, think about those different things that if you do run out of whatever you have, or say the water gets shut off, what what do you have that's going to do it? What do you have that's going to work in certain situations? So if you have a Sawyer Mini, that is going to work for some of the minor stuff. But if you're going to City Park and filling up your five gallon jugs with water, and you're gonna you put that through a Sawyer Mini, mm -hmm. um, you may end up with the bubbly guts or or even something worse because who knows what's in that water? A Sawyer yeah. Mini is not going to get that out. So understand what you have and what it's going to do. Yeah, no, you, you you have to, and again, you have to plan for this stuff. I mean, how, people, I mean, there's there's a bunch of states that doesn't even let you collect your rainwater legally, right? So, um, what are your options if, if things go south? Well, everybody's kind of agreeing. We all go, oh yeah, well, everything will keep going along hunky dory, because they, you know, the the big they, they say it's going to keep going along hunky dory, but when it doesn't go along and everybody like goes without water or things happen they don't take it, like any ownership of that yeah. yeah yeah all right so enough on water uh, let's move on to food and you've got um food is is one of those that maybe it's not as it, I, oh, yeah, I guarantee you it's not as important as water because you can go a while we were talking about this earlier with going a few days without food you can go a while and you can still be alive, <laughs> but yeah. how well you function um, is that's going to be a big role in all of that stuff. Yeah. I, you know, and I don't know about other people, man. I am a, uh, it's why I eat the same crap over and over every day, pretty much. Cause I'm a comfort food eater, right? Once I start getting down that road of like, Oh, let me taste this and let me taste that. Then it's Katie bar the door. I'll eat everything in the cupboard. So, <laughs> so I limit myself, you know, but, um, I think food it's when times are bad, it's, you don't want to like not have food, right? Like food is a comfort. It makes you feel better. Like, Oh, that was warm. It tasted good. You know, holding up a cup of coffee and just staring in the coffee and, and s s smelling it, right. Inhaling it and taking that sip. Like you can kind of, break the stress of a situation a little bit by doing that's part of the reason why we probably like coffee so much other than the fact that caffeine's addictive but you know there, there's things with food that just beyond nutrition that's important to make sure you have and i think we have the ability a lot more nowadays to like you know plan some variety in it go out, if you're going to go buy cans you know like everybody goes out and buys cans can of foods i, I love going down like in the the uh, hispanic section and getting like the the canned tamales and stuff like that and throwing in there like all right maybe i'll i mean they're they're shitty tamales. It's not like getting fresh tamales that you can get around. Yeah. They're Southwest here. <laughs> and you know what? If you're eating out of a can, man, I'd have rather have the shitty tamales than no tamales. And, you know, maybe that's a treat one day. I'll tell you what, if it, if, if you're rationing and you're only getting 2000 calories or 1500 calories a day, whatever it is, that can of tamales is going to taste fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's going to taste wonderful. So, yeah, food is, is one of those where it's not the – and also, like we were talking about earlier with bugging in and being under siege, basically, and being able to last throughout the whole situation. I think food mm -hmm. is super important, not having to go out. Uh, and that leads to number seven here. You talk about a heavy-duty backpack. I've talked about it a couple times. We were talking about it with Ukraine where you never know, depending on what the situation is. I mean, and it could be a number of dis different situations. 
you never know when that opportunity may come up where you have to go out. Maybe it's to scout something. Maybe it's to uh, pick up supplies for one thing or another. Maybe it is to go get that water. So we think of bug out bags and backpacks and all that just for that, the getting home stuff, the three day bag, uh, the I'm never coming home bag, all that stuff. But honestly, in when you're talking about some SHTF type situation, it's going to be super useful. It's going to be one of those things where you don't want to, don't leave home without it. Basically, if you're going somewhere doing something, you're going to want to have that to be able to take with you. So, if if if, it, if it's a SHTF world and and things are that bad and you leave your house, your you know your castle, your fortified place, and you go somewhere else, well, if they're that bad and you you had to fortify it and you're and you're living in it because it's fortified, well. Stuff may happen while you're gone. Like that place may be gone. Now you have to plan that, right? You're going to the grocery store, bringing a bunch of big backpack stuff in the car. Now you can't put any groceries in. You, you got to plan your your stuff out. I, I would always plan um, to make sure you have enough stuff on you, like with a little go bag, like just something you throw over your shoulder to go for maybe a day or two out of that. Like you, you won't be comfortable, but you can have some food bars and stuff like that where you can get by and, extra ammo, medical stuff, you know, all that kind of good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So number eight, um, we'll talk about eight and nine together. Um, actually we could just talk about all three of these if you want, but uh, yeah. backup power flashlights, head, uh, headlights and batteries. I think those, especially these days with all the technology and all of this stuff that we have available to us now, a lot mm -hmm. of the prepping gear that takes all of this stuff. I think it's super important to at least have those little battery backups, the 2000 to 10,000 milliamp hour uh, battery banks, uh, whether it's, you know, solar would be better, but it doesn't necessarily have to be solar. Um, some of those that have the solar panels on them don't work all that great anyway. So you may want to buy uh, an actual solar panel that puts out 25 Watts or so at, at the minimum to be able to charge those batteries. But mm -hmm. all of this stuff is is super important. It's not like the old days of prepping, right, where you had the the al big D alkaline batteries and a big old honk and flashlight. There's a lot of different options these days. Uh, lightweight, uh, smaller, all of that stuff. Yeah, I think all that stuff's important, man. You need to. I, I like the idea that you mentioned about the solar. Right, try to try to do what you can to recharge it. Try to see. You know, you always have an option with that way. Um, and try to standardize your batteries, right? you end up with just having all yep. these different types of batteries that kind of makes it makes it a pain where if you get it standardized it, it's a lot better it's like you know sometimes when i think about like my my firearm setup i have a little uh sub 2000 uh caltech right it's a little carbine and, and it's chambered in the in, in glock magazine so i can use my same glock magazines for my pistol in that carbine so it makes it you know it just has a lot more universal application on stuff so just plan on what you're doing and thinking about how you got to go about it but having that extra backup power is always important yeah hey real quick i gotta um i'm gonna share they're talking about the jackery 1500 in the chat oh cool i've never heard that of that so i wanted to put this up and um so it's basically oh what is this nonsense in the wind <laughs> Um, 1700 bucks. Whoo. That's why I've never looked at that, but, um, a portable power station, pretty yeah. cool. Um, uh, 202 was talking about it. Sage was talking about it. So, uh, pretty interesting. It looks kind of neat. Maybe that's, see, there's so many different things that, that these big ticket items, you've got the, the dehydrator, uh, that, that would be wonderful to have. You've got uh, a power station like this. That would be awesome. Um, but, uh, again, it, it's not it's not necessary to go out and and get something like this. It'd be fantastic, but well, there are other options that are um, budget friendly, yeah. I suppose. I think that gets back to where you have to look at your plan and come up with a plan, and you know, go by what you can afford and, and figure out what you can get for like the best value that you can get for your stuff. Maybe the jackery is something you know, like early on, you, you're happy getting a. Uh, you know, anchor like little foldable solar panel and the ability to recharge some triple double A AA or triple A batteries. Like that's your initial step. And then you work up and down the road, you get the Jackery, but have a plan. Yeah, so that way, yeah. you know, you, you can, uh, uh, did you disappear again? So you can, you I'm can hit buttons. I'm just like, randomly hitting buttons. Yeah. <laughs> 
but have a plan so you can you can decide what's the most important thing to get and and you know address it in a logical manner so that way you're not wasting money you're not wasting time you're not preparing out of like we're all out of balance with your preparedness or and all that yeah yeah all right so let's go back to your article uh if i can find it here uh and we were on uh, we just talked about backup power. So what we'll do is go into the emergency communication and then we'll end this with navigation, but emergency communications, I don't think it, a lot of people tend to, you know, think that you need to get certified in ham radio and, and all of that stuff, but it's, there's really a lot more to it to that than that. And also that ham radio stuff is going to be a lot less useful, uh, to most people than just being able to, you know, get information over the radio or maybe being able to mun communicate if you're in a bug out route, being able to communicate between cars or if you're scouting an area, uh, those walkie talkies and stuff, being able to talk to each other. Now, understanding ham radio and all that would be fantastic, but there's a lot more that goes into it um, than just talking to somebody from three counties over. Yeah. Well, I communication is always important. I think the ham radio it, understanding how to receive on it so you can get information, I, I don't. Yeah. I think is much more important than understanding how to transmit, um, and having backup plans for that. One of the things that's jamming the Russians up is the Russians came out had all this great new high end technology, right? That that relied on having three G cell towers all around. Well, the the cell towers all got blown up and all kinds of stuff happened. So they have. They have units that are designed like tanks and stuff that are ECM tanks that are supposed to help jam, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, stuff that the Ukrainians are doing. Well, they're sitting on the side of the road deadline because they can't do anything because all this technology they relied on, you know, ha has, has kind of uh, crapped the bed. So I think when it comes to communication, having a ham radio, but having backup options, right, figuring out some different ways you can communicate with people. Yeah, you know, and 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 come up with that. Maybe it, it comes down to because part of the problem the Russians have also is in order to communicate because all their their radios that were all supposed to work off this three G stuff are all dead. These guys are using their cell phones and using like unencrypted radios. So now they're out there broadcasting the stuff, and the and the Ukrainians are just getting all kinds of active intel. They 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 killed one of the generals that way. The general was on the cell phone. They figured out where he was at and bombed his ass. So. Having alternate forms of communication, having having the ability to encrypt your conversations is hugely important. So if you know, hey, obviously if you want to go down the ha the ham route, do that. Um, but making sure that you have secure comms and, and and all that's a really big thing. Yeah, I was just trying to look up the Carry Smart Canner because they were talking about it in the chat. Um, it's a desktop one. I'll, I'll I'll talk about that here in a second. But yeah, I mean it, the communications is is super important, especially when you're you know talking about defensive stuff like you were just talking about, uh, and and protection and all that. So it's not just um, you know getting word about what disasters are going on. Uh, if you've got to set some sort of coordinated neighborhood group together, uh, mm -hmm. communications are going to be a huge part of that, as well as getting that collecting gathering information getting that stuff to understand exactly what's going on uh, and where everything's going. So yeah. um, with that, we'll go to your next one here. You've got, uh, let me see, I get find the right tab, navigation tools. And this is one that I, I think a lot of people have kind of lost sight of, of with, with our cell phones, you basically plug in an address. You can find any place in the world you, you want to get in an SHTF situation, who knows if cell towers are on or working, if that stuff's available. So I think a lot of people, a majority, a major majority of people are going to be ass out when something happens where they've got to actually figure out how to get somewhere, uh, figure out how to use the sun, uh, figure out all the different techniques that we kind of know about as preppers uh, to navigate. Uh, talk to Speak to that a little bit, what you were talking about in this article with that. Yeah, you just have to know how to get places, right? People, yeah, get in there, and so I have two. I have I have two vehicles, right? I have I have my one year old pimped out GMC dually diesel with all the bells and whistles in it for comfort and all that. Well, when I drive that one, I can almost drive half asleep. It tells me everywhere to go, and then I have an old an old van, right? That I had that I, uh, had Rhino line basically out of it, and I'm working on converting it. And 
that one doesn't have any bells and whistles. So I got, it, it's crazy. Like I have learned so much more about the town because I actually have to figure out where I'm going now and pay attention. So I think people, what the navigation tools are really is you have to be able to get places. And, and if it's an SHTF event, you can't rely on your cell phone to work. You can't the compass on your cell phone, the, the Siri, you can't rely on you know, necessarily GPSs, you know, that, that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, how do you get places? I know like in my truck, I always carry a, a U.S. map book. It's one of the things I, I think if, you know, in, in, in Brian's skewed world of like, oh, when I have to go walk down the highway to try to get 10 states away kind of thing that Peppers think about, like I'm bringing that U.S. map book with me. Like knowing where you're at and where you're going is so important. Yeah. And, and one more thing on that too is understanding your area. I think is is really important as well because that's most likely we we talked about it a couple of times with the bug in situations. Most likely, any sort of disaster situation or anything like that, you're going to be staying home. You're not going to be going all over the place. You're not going to be doing all sorts of things. So, understanding what resources are around you, what you're going to have to do to get to those resources. Maybe like you were talking about in, in your article a little bit, um, different places for temporary shelter, different places for protection. If you do have to bug out temporarily to get away from people. So just understanding what's all around you, what are some possible, I mean, look at things from a prepper perspective oh. and what are some possible, you know, things that you could use to your advantage. And understand when you're, when you're like, and don't do it in a way that, that scares the hell out of them, but like, Okay, something yeah. happens in the middle of the night at your house and you don't see it coming. So people are in different bedrooms, different parts of the house. And everybody is like, oh, I got to get out of here, right? Well, where are you meeting up? Where, you know, how, how's everybody getting there? You know, what are you doing when you get there? Do you have stuff there? If you, if you get up and run out of your house in the middle of the night, are you bringing anything with you? Maybe not. Yeah. So thinking things like that. What, what's little Timmy going to do when he can't plug in the GPS to, to get to that pre- Well, what's pre little final? Timmy going to do when Timmy runs out of the house and, you know, because a bunch of bad people just came in kicking in the front door, when, you know, where's he going to go, much less have the, G, you know, like he needs to know what to do. Yeah, yeah. Where's he, where yeah. can he go hide? Yeah, so uh, at any rate, very cool article. You've got a few more um, art items down here that um, we got to get out of here pretty soon because we got to do the the Zoom call after show. Yeah. Uh, but you've got a few more things about gimmicky stuff and very cool article. Thanks, um, I think next week you just showed me an article that you wrote on bugging in and you talked about it at the beginning. We're gonna go through that one as well because that's got a lot of cool stuff in it. Um, so we're gonna we're just it's gonna be the. The Mind for Survivalist Preppers <laughs> podcast coming up, but um, well, just you know a very what, cool man, article. I, I was thinking about that earlier today, and it's like, again, it comes back to what we talked about at the beginning of the show, right? Like, I don't know in my life when I have felt like things were so uncertain with the big scheme of things, like for everybody right now, right? Like, you know, I people talk about like this is the 70s. I don't. The seventies, I don't even. I, I think that there was like a cultural thing going on, like cultural revolution and all that stuff happening. But I don't recall as a kid people feeling this unsafe about the state of the world, yeah, the state of yeah. what's happening. And there's a reason people feel that way because, like, we're going farther down that path. So I think it's an important time to go over these articles, and everybody should you know go back in and re re reexamine their preparedness if they haven't done so lately. Yeah, it, it seems like it wouldn't take much for you know that tipping point is closer than it's ever been yeah uh, hey before we get out of here i wanted to show this uh they were talking about the carry or a an electric scanner and i got this a while back and i know people are apprehensive about electric canning uh because i i'm not putting one of those the the cool canners on my glass top stove it's not happening so i did a lot of research on this i i um, listened to a, a podcast episode with jack spearco talking about this mm -hmm. um this one's got the valve on top where it actually builds up the pressure and all that so this is absolutely 100 percent will work um for canning i've had it for seven eight years we're still here uh use it quite a bit so uh, not as much anymore as I used to, but it absolutely works. So if you're in an apartment, you're in, uh, uh, you don't want to use your glass stove and risk that stuff. Uh, it's freaking awesome. But look at Amazon for the Carry Smart Canner. Um, uh, look up the Survival Podcast and listen to Jack Spirico talking about it. I've got a video over at Survival's Prepper. I go into a lot of details about it. 
but I, I would recommend it and I use it all the time for uh, pressure canning and stuff like that. So, um, with that though, uh, let me put this stuff on, uh, if I can find it. Um, but with that though, I think we are out of here today. Otherwise we're going to be super late for our own meeting <laughs> coming up after the after show. Um, if you are a member, make sure, uh, check your email for that link. If not, just log into the bug out location, go to your profile page and click that link. If you're not a member, you can go to thebugoutlocation.com uh, and become one. Uh, and then every most weeks we do our uh, backstage pass video, which is basically like this, where we're talking just bonus content. And then once a month, the first Sunday of every month, uh, we go and do a Zoom meeting where we get everybody that wants to can join the call and we all have a conversation. So uh, with that, do you have anything else to add before we get out of here, Brian? No, man. It was a good show, dude. Thanks. Thanks, everybody, yeah. for the chat. Man. There's a bunch of people in there talking tonight. I love this. Uh, I love this this multi-stream whatever thing is we got going on here. This is awesome. Yeah, the restreaming thing. The one thing that I noticed, though, is that uh, I'm getting like three comments from the same person coming through at the same time, so I got to filter uh, through them. But yeah. um, I, that's just on my end, so I'll, I'll figure that out. That's the least of my worries tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so, But at any rate, um, I appreciate it, everyone, and we will talk to you all later. Bye, y'all. You're still here. It's over. Go home. <laughs>